San Diego is full of surprises. Even the sun, where the sun is, affects us, as you will see. A solid story about the rock of ages and our visit that ended up being a lesson on age. We remember the street corner that rang out with the happy sounds of a particular music at a very special time in our history. And they would have uh, bands from all over the place come in. We've gotten so many questions, what is the story about this Carmel Valley graveyard? People making their own markers and honoring their deceased in their own way. Maybe you've been on this county road. If so, did you know it has a name, a name that goes back more than 70 years to when this really was the Highway to the Stars. Plus, things you've sent in and more stories too, all of them true, about San Diego. Ken Kramer's About San Diego, the history and people of the area we call home. Here's Ken Kramer. Hi, and thank you for being here. Welcome to the show about San Diego. We really have fun doing this every week, and we love that you like it too. We have a lot of stories, so we're gonna get right into it. And to start, we have proof that there's a story almost everywhere if you look in the right direction. This story, for example, a little something you may have noticed about San Diego and wondered why, why is it that most everybody in this gathering audience here is going to end up looking directly into the sun? A few years ago, somebody said, well, let's rent them some umbrellas. And that makes a huge difference in a, on a Sunday afternoon. But still, look, it seems backwards. The daytime sun is in your eyes here, while the stage, which should be in the sun, is in the shade. And if you've ever wondered why, well, it has everything to do with being cool. Really. First, a bit of history. This is the Spreckles Organ Pavilion, of course, where there have been free concerts every Sunday for a very long time now. But not just that. Over the years, Ross Porter told us some really famous celebrities have stood in the shade while looking out at crowds who all had the sun in their eyes. Yes, uh, Albert Einstein comes to mind. Uh, Herbert Hoover spoke on this stage in 1935. Amy Semple McPherson, the great evangelist, uh, did uh, revivals here. I wonder if they thought things ought to be turned around here, you know? If you're watching the show, the sun should be at your back and shining on the stage, right? But... The fact that the, that the organ is, is north-facing means that the stage and the console and the pipes are well-protected, uh, and the audience is the ones who get to look into the sunshine. Ross Porter is executive director of the Spreckles Organ Society, so we went to him about this because it seems so strange the building was backwards. <laughs> And it turns out it's one of those cool little things done intentionally. If the hot San Diego sun were allowed to beat right down on this organ and the pipes, wouldn't be good. Not at all. The, the difference in, in temperatures from the front of the organ to the back of the organ would throw it out of tune much more easily. It was an engineering consideration from day one. How do we protect an outdoor organ from the elements? Well, in San Diego, you build it facing north. So? So the audience gets to look into the sunshine, but the pipes are well shaded. And we thought that was a cool story about San Diego. There's one more thing I'll add to this whole sun in your eyes thing. It's worth it. If you have never been to the Spreckles Organ Concerts in Balboa Park, they are so well programmed and such a civic treat every Sunday at 2 o'clock. That was Jared Jacobson you saw there performing, who once was our civic organist, but who came back for a show on that particular day. These concerts are completely free of charge, by the way, and always have been. Okay, change of location now. We're going to Carmel Valley, and every once in a while I'll get an email or a question about something you see there. It used to be much more visible before the freeway was built, and it's always seemed to generate this curiosity. How did it get there? What's the story? Well, let's take a look. Highway 56 on the north side, maybe a mile and a half before you get to I-5, over the fence from the westbound lanes, here is something a lot of people wonder about. Under the spreading pepper trees, it looks like a graveyard, one that must have been here for a long, long time. It's a great story, and it has to do with the Sisters of Mercy, um, who are part of the, the Roman Church, and they are dedicated especially toward helping 
um, the ill, the uneducated, and the impoverished. We went to Seth Malios, professor of anthropology at San Diego State and our graveyard guy. He's written about little-known burial spots, and he researched this tiny cemetery. He says in the 1890s, long before the 56 freeway came, on the open acres of land that used to be around here, those Sisters of Mercy had an orphanage. They, they also had cattle. Um, they started a dairy. Uh, they had hired a, a Chinese man to run their garden for them. And starting about 1900, there were burials here, just a few graves. And we wondered, was it the Sisters when they died? Well, this is where it gets fascinating because the cemetery wasn't just for the Sisters of Mercy. Many of the people buried on the Roman Catholic side were Mexican laborers that were working up near Solana Beach. Yes, that's another thing. It turns out there are two sides to this cemetery. The Catholic side is on the west, and about 100 yards to the east is where the Protestants were buried. Their rock headstones clearly surviving the decades. By the way, together, Catholics and Protestants, records show 83 burials, the last one in the 1960s. And there are only 55 gravestones there. So some of the burials, some of the markers have been lost over time. On the west side especially, time has taken its toll on the simple markers. A brush fire in the 1930s burned most anything that was wood, so other sticks and crosses took their place. Now you often see no name at all on these humble graves. To Seth Malios, that's part of what makes this simple place under the trees by the 56 freeway so interesting and in its own way so elegant. This was not Mount Hope. This was not Greenwood. You know, this was not Holy Cross. This was something where you had working class people who were making their own grave markers, you know, really getting into that folk culture, people making their own markers and honoring their deceased in their own way. So if you've ever wondered, that is the story. This little graveyard may seem at odds with the freeway so close. Here's to those who, even today, as a work of mercy, stop by from time to time to honor and maintain it a bit. And here's hoping the passing of time and traffic are merciful also to this place so filled with history about San Diego. The Sisters of Mercy have some history with the Carmelite nuns, that's one thing. And it is said that the view the setting in this particular area of San Diego County where they were working reminded the sisters of Mount Carmel in the Holy Land and that either or both of those things resulted in the name Carmel Valley. There was a time in San Diego when if you were looking for fun, let's say on a Saturday night, and you were in the Navy stationed here, well, you might get in the car and head for one particular place. And I will say it helped if you liked to dance and you had a taste for a kind of music that you could hear on the radio in Central California and parts of Texas and a lot of areas of the Southwest. Now, if you've been here for 50 years, you might say, oh, I know what he's talking about, but take a minute here with me and let's go back for just a brief look because this place was fun and really helped to put one community on the map. To see it today, you might never know what this building used to be. Today, it's a banquet hall and social center in El Cajon called the Royal Palace, and Matt Matias family owns it. All different types of cultures, parties. Tonight, we have the First Holy Communion. We do a lot of quinceaneras, weddings. And one more thing, it's at the corner of Broadway and Bostonia. And that name, Bostonia, is going to be important to our story. It's a neighborhood in El Cajon, and back in the 1860s, a few dozen families moved from Boston to the El Cajon Valley to grow grapes. There was a Boston General store, and another store at 2nd and Broadway was a landmark for generations. But I tell you, for San Diegans of a certain age, that Bostonia name and this building in particular have so much meaning. For this was the Bostonia Ballroom. And in the 1950s into the mid-60s, there were legendary country music and western swing headliners on stage here nearly every weekend. Performers like Patsy Cline, Dolly Parton, Johnny Cash have played, and some of them have even stayed here. If tiny Bostonia was like the Nashville of Southern California, then the Bostonia Ballroom was the Grand Ole Opry. When they opened up on Friday and Saturday night, all the sailors would come into town. This is Andrea Long. She still lives in El Cajon. 
still keeps pictures and the meticulous business records her dad maintained back then. There's Johnny Cash. Bostonia Ballroom was the brainchild of her dad, a fiddle player known as Cactus Soldi, Larry DePaul, who played the accordion, and country singer Smokey Rogers. It was a family. My mother sold tickets, <laughs> and uh, my dad took care of the, the money end of it, and Smokey was, uh, you know, Smokey was the star, you know, when, <laughs> when it came time to perform. Since you're gone, the stars, the moon, the sun in the sky. Smokey Rogers was a singer, sweet songwriter, and San Diego TV kids show host who was co-owner of the Bostonia. Through those curtains there, there, there's a door that leads to a second level. Up here, this used to be an apartment where Smokey's mom and dad lived, and from where a very young Andrea could hear all this amazing music. To get there, she had to go through the dressing room. I come through there and I'm, is everybody decent? Smokey says, come on in. <laughs> and I walked in and I saw Marty Robbins with one foot in his pants. He was, he was changing into his, his costume. It was <laughs> there were singers like Marty Robbins, but also Western Swing, the dance tunes of the rural Southwest, a cowboy's version of the big bands. The music was so infectious and so fun, and it was popular enough that you could find it on television. There was Tex Williams. His hit song was Smoke, Smoke, Smoke That Cigarette. Smoke, smoke, smoke that cigarette. Puff, 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 and if you smoke yourself to death, tell St. Peter at the Golden Gate. You hate to make him wait. You've got to have another cigarette. And Bob Wills, the king of Western Swing. Stay all night, stay a little longer, dance all night, dance a little longer, pull off the coat, throw it in the corner, don't see why you don't stay a little longer. So there they'd be, in a film or on TV one week, and come to the Bostonia the next. It was a great time, but everything has its life. All things come to an end. Maybe music tastes were changing, or the stars of country and western swing were playing bigger venues for more money. My dad and Smokey decided to part ways. They, they'd been partners and, and playing music together since 1935. And uh, I, you know, it was a, a time to break it up after a while. Eventually, the Bostonia closed. You go through all these special things and, and you don't realize how special it is until much later. And looking back to the joyous music ringing from that street corner in El Cajon every weekend, I don't know if there'll ever be anything quite like it again. Still you're gone. We have to do more about the Bostonia sometime and the Valley Music Store and how much they meant to so many musicians. The ballroom inspired Lee Cook and the Joe Grease Band's song about the place, and we can link you to that through our website. Change of location now and back in time to when San Diego had stars in its eyes. This was a very big scientific happening, and we were at the center of it all. Now it's being remembered because of a roadway, a highway. There's a crowd gathered here for an unveiling. You ready? Here we go. It says Highway to the Stars, and that's exactly what this road through Valley Center here used to be called. And why? Well, back more than 70 years. Palomar Mountain had been selected years previously after many observations as an ideal site for a telescope. Yes, but look at the road to get up to the dome at Mount Palomar, twisting, turning. Now imagine trying to get the most valuable piece of glass in history something planned for and worked for for years, the centerpiece of the Palomar Telescope, its 200-inch reflecting mirror getting it up this road. And the two days required to move the mirror were only scheduled after the weatherman had promised ideal California sunshine. It was a hold your breath, anything can happen adventure. Oh, and it was raining. Finally, after years of patient effort, the heart of the telescope is pulled safely into the shelter of the huge protecting dome. It's hard for us to appreciate today, I think, what a big deal this telescope was, how crowds came out to see the mirror go by, how many who lived or worked along the route identified with the pride of this scientific achievement. So much so, they started calling it the Highway to the Stars. You were going up to see the telescope, or you saw signs reminding you that you were on the Highway to the Stars. Today, we think of it as County Road S6. 
from Escondido right through Valley Center and then twisting and turning thousands of feet up to the crystal clear air of that magnificent mountaintop. And look, the signs are coming back. The Valley Center History Museum, Historical Society, and Community Planning Group is reviving that old name. They've placed new signs along the route. It's a nod to history, a celebration of scientific triumph, and a renewed tribute to something internationally famous about San Diego. The Valley Center Historical Society has extensive files on the highway and the telescope, and it's available to be seen by the public anytime. The telescope has been described as one of the most consequential scientific instruments of the past 100 years. And if you head up there to see it, you'll find it's all very quiet. And you wonder, you know, it started work in 1948. Do they still use it? And the answer is yes, they do. They're doing science up there every clear night. Here's a question about San Diego. What classic science fiction movie from 1953 includes a scene shot at Palomar Observatory? Was it Abbott and Costello Go to Mars, Invaders from Mars, or It Came from Outer Space? And the answer is... Invaders from Mars. Weird, fantastic beings of a super intelligence, ruling a race of synthetic humans and pitting them against mankind's dream to conquer the universe. If you knew that, you know a lot about San Diego. Okay, a few months ago, I was talking with some friends and they said, you know, there is this house in Lakeside that has a story to it. It was built by one man who carried blocks of rock home with him every day until he had enough to build a house for himself, his wife, and their growing family in the 1930s. It's a unique place, big, maybe, you know, the, the rock, rocks are like a foot thick, recognized by the historical society there. And I thought, well, that, that's kind of interesting. Let's go take a look. And along the way, we met the owner who we liked, and we thought you might too. We've come to call on Edna Coons today, see if she might have a word or two for us. You, uh, do I come in? And I had to say, Edna, I don't know anybody who lives in a house like this. I, I tell you the truth, I don't either. It's made of granite. It's a granite house, which she's lived in since the day it was built, rock solid and strong through the decades, kind of like Edna herself. Listen to what she told us when we wondered how old she might be. I was born June 15, 1914, and right in San Diego. 103 when we talked with her and absolutely adored here at the Lakeside History Center, where on Wednesdays we found her in her element, a living treasure full of stories about local history and about her hero, her late husband, Ermin, who worked at the Silver Gray Granite Company's quarry in Lakeside, where every day there'd be leftover scraps of granite rock just going to waste. Well, Ermin had an idea. Yeah, he said, we're, we're gonna build a house. We're gonna build a house, and we did. Bringing home what he could, maybe two of these rocks every day, he finally had enough, and with the help of a granite mason, started in building a building, which ended up being a marvel. You think of the imagination it took to envision this house, and then the labor, the sweat, the strength it took to muscle these granite stones into place? The walls are about 12, 14 inches thick, and it's uh, very warm in the uh, winter, but it's cool in the summer, and it's just a very, very comfortable place. And I'm so happy that I I can stay here. The house is set back from the road. She was private about anybody just coming here, didn't want her address or location to be made public, and we respect that. We figured she was entitled to some privacy after a long and fulfilling life. But I quite often I will ask the, the Lord at night, I said, what are you saving me for? What do you want me to do? I'm 103. And he hasn't told me. <laughs> he won't tell me. Maybe it's to be an inspiration. 
For we were inspired, hearing about this granite home she lives in and the work it must have taken to build it. I'm glad to share this because I love this old house. But we also kept thinking about Edna herself. At 103, wow, she was doing something right. I feel wonderful. And that, I think, is the really inspiring story here about San Diego. By the way, in talking with Edna, she happened to mention to me that she was a musician and used to play from time to time, and guess where? At the Bostonia Ballroom, saxophone. There's another thing about this story, well, really about the granite itself, those blocks that Edna's husband carried home back in the 1930s. They were scrap left over from the granite quarry where he worked, and that quarry had another distinction. Out of it was produced something that I think you've probably seen. It was a project to produce a piece of art that would be along the San Diego waterfront. So they got dynamite and blasted away at this hard rock until they had the perfect, very big piece they wanted, and they lifted it out very carefully. Then a famous sculptor named Donald Horde went to work on it and eventually loaded it onto a truck and took it down to what was then our Civic Center, where it was unveiled a masterpiece in the same granite from that same quarry called Guardian of the Waters. It faces west onto Harbor Drive and looks out over the bay from the county building. Like Edna's house, strong as rock for more than 80 years. Okay, time to see what you've sent us, your pictures and memories about San Diego that you've sent along for all to see. We do thank you for them, and here we go. Recognize where this is? Steve Hall says his mom took it in 1946. It's Bayside Walk in Pacific Beach, just south of where the Catamaran Hotel is today. Ruth Lamb of Escondido sent a picture taken February the 22nd, 1952, just about to land at Lindbergh Field. That's a B-36. These were huge planes that were always flying in and out of San Diego, where they had jet engines added to the six engines driving propellers that faced backwards. Stephen Strahan sent a picture of a couple looking calm, mostly, considering they were going up in a balloon from downtown San Diego. They married a year later in 1912 and in time became his grandparents. Doing anything on June the 23rd of 1954, let's go to the jalopy races. Old cars pacing and racing at Balboa Stadium was a big attraction. P. Hicks found some 8mm movie film of jalopies on the track. For Gene Ray, who sent these pictures, jalopy racing was a family affair. His father-in-law was Adrian Van Vanderwist, who was pretty well known in racing circles, or ovals, at Balboa Stadium, most of which was later torn down out of earthquake concerns. It's now the site of the track for San Diego High School. We want to update you on a couple of stories. Thank you to Michael Redding. You might remember we suggested that there ought to be an award for longtime service to community and how that award ought to be given to a good old wooden streetcar number 54, which well over a century ago used to run back and forth, back and forth between San Diego and La Jolla with its friendly crew. Well, I think they were friendly. Anyway, we wondered if Car 54 had become a meal for termites or busted up for kindling, but no. Turns out it was passed from owner to owner. Story is, for a time, it was used as a hot dog stand, was at the Whaley House for a while, and eventually ended up in storage for safekeeping at the San Diego History Center. But it's since moved again, and Car 54, where are you? in a protected covered space of honor where everybody can see it at the San Diego Electric Railway Association's National City Depot. Drop by and pay your respects. And Jim Reeves wrote us back when they were working on the Georgia Street Bridge. Remember, he said, go and check this out. So we did, and look, can you see what workers uncovered beneath the pavement there? Those parallel lines are old streetcar tracks dating back 70 or more years to when San Diego had streetcars that linked our communities and connected our neighborhoods together. They just paved right over them, and for a few days, you could see them again before they were torn out as scrap metal. Here's a close-up picture that Jim took of the rails that used to take San Diegans where we needed to go. 
And finally, the picture Glenn Sheets sent us of Johnny Downs selling Golden Arrow milk on TV was sure to bring back memories of the days of home milk delivery. Today, milk comes to the customer, whether at home, store, or restaurant, at the peak of its triple goodness, fresh, pure, and energizing, enriched by added vitamins. Kim Mills sent us this one, says, here's my grandfather and his Klingman's few acres dairy truck back in 1948. This is Ray Thompson's picture of the Knox Dairy in the 4800 block of Logan Avenue, San Diego, 13, California. Knox delivered to your door, sometimes came right into the house and put the milk in the refrigerator while you slept. Foremost even had a talking cow to help sell its home delivered milk. And as long as you keep drinking it, I'll keep giving it. Well, thank you, Bossy the Cow, and thanks to all for the memories about San Diego. And that's it for this time and this episode of About San Diego. To see these stories again, to send along your photos and memories, or to learn more about some of the stories you've seen here, just go to our website, KenKramerTV.com, or join the conversation at Ken Kramer's About San Diego on Facebook. We post some stories and announcements on there, and we will see you next time. Until then, and as always, I'm Ken Kramer. Thank you for watching and for caring about San Diego. Support for this program comes from the KPBS Explore Local Content Fund, supporting new ideas and programs for San Diego.